This is a tower defense game running in real time with 200,000 plus units. The performance might not be the best and I don't have the best computer either but this game remains completely playable. In this video, I'm going to detail every step that I took along the way in making this game. Let's hop right into it. For this project, I'm going to use the Bevy game engine and the programming language Rust. Right off the bat, we need a way to render a very large amount of units. With that in mind, let me introduce instanced rendering. Usually we would go around and render meshes one at a time, but what if we took one singular mesh and just copied it around a lot for every unit? We are able to render every unit in one draw call. With that in mind, I decided to stress test this system by rendering 1 million cubes, and it worked quite well. Some of you might know that Bevy actually does automatic instancing as of version 0.12 of the engine, but there's a reason I'm implementing it on my own. By writing my own shader, I'm able to only include rendering properties that I need, such as using simple tricks to fake lighting in a custom shader, which will be marginally more performant than the standard materials which Bevy provides. Another big reason is that Bevy renders objects per entity, and I'm not actually going to be using Bevy's ECS system for the units themselves in order to improve performance. Okay, enough messing around, let's start creating some units. I rearranged all the cubes so they were on the same Y level and made them the same color. You might notice that the FPS has dropped from a stable 40 FPS to close to 22 FPS. That's strange, why is this happening? Well, if you look closer, you might notice a grid on the floor. In this scene, we are partitioning the cubes onto a massive grid in what is called spatial hashing. Those of you who have watched my previous video where I created a battle simulator game might remember a term called spatial partitioning. I'm going to be using a very simple form of spatial partitioning which basically divides our scene into a very large grid. Each logic update, we iterate through this grid and update the units in this grid while only checking collisions with units that are in the same cell. This avoids looping through every other unit when checking for collisions in what will ultimately become a very inefficient ON squared approach to collision detection. The spatial hashing method which I'm about to introduce is very easy to implement because all it takes is some basic arithmetic. Allow me to demonstrate. Let's say we have a grid which is just a 1D array with indexes assigned to each cell as follows. The dimensions of each cell are 3x3 for the purpose of this demonstration, and we've placed some units in the grid which currently just sit there with a position component. How can we go from the original unit position to an index in this grid? Well, it's actually very simple. First, we divide the position of each unit by the size of the cells in the grid. Next, since the first cell in our grid is not located at the origin but at the top left corner of the grid, we shift the x position by half the width of the entire grid, flip the sign of the y value, and shift that value by half of the height of the entire grid. That might sound quite confusing, but in basic terms, we've converted our world space coordinates to local grid space coordinates. Now we take the floor function of every value which gives us the 2D index of the cell our objects are in. From this point, we just call a flatten function to get the actual index in a 1D array. As you can see, this whole operation is just a bunch of arithmetic which our computers definitely won't have any trouble running. These are just the steps we need to take in order to place our units into a spatial hash. After doing so, we still need to implement collision resolution and unit movement. For collision, all we have to do is loop through all the units in a cell and update them accordingly. In order to assure that none of our units can clip into each other, I introduced a separation vector which would get stronger the closer our units were to each other. This worked quite well, but there were still a few corner cases such as what to do when units got together at the intersection of all four cells. I had already accounted for neighboring cells by checking the two neighboring cells of a grid or the diagonal cell if the unit intersected those regions, but it seems that the solution which I came up with doesn't account for units when they're at the intersection of all four cells. I decided to accept this compromise because solving this singular corner case, which is very unlikely to actually occur in a game scenario, would mean even worse performance than I had already sacrificed in checking a limited amount of neighboring cells. Now that we have a system in place, it's time to replace our cubes with an actual 3D model. So I created this orc model in Blender and even made a texture for it. After adding some uniform variables for the texture, I was able to modify the rendering pipeline to support Support textured meshes, and now we have some actual units in our scene. But this isn't enough. The units are kind of just sliding around and it all seems super unrealistic without animations. To add animations, we can't just rig a model traditionally and call it a day. To make full use of our instancing system, we are going to need to create each animation frame statically in Blender and export these frames as a mesh. To play the animations, we need to create multiple groups of instanced meshes instead of just one and dynamically modify the buffers each frame to draw animated units. It does seem like a cheap hack, but it's one that takes a very minimal toll on our resources and that's really what's the most important. 
Okay, since we don't really need our units to do anything but move around, we've pretty much finished creating our unit system. It's time to get into creating some actual gameplay. Since we're trying to create a tower defense game, we can't really do much without creating an actual level. How do we actually create a level for a game like this though? I decided to make each cell on the spatial partitioning grid a possible location to build on, sort of like a 2D tile map with very large cells except it's also in 3D. An advantage of this approach, which is the reason I actually picked it, was that it integrated our spatial partitioning system really well into the actual gameplay, so it wouldn't be too much of a hassle for us to apply collisions between units and walls or try to find a unit to attack with our towers. To actually create the level, I decided to go for something new and create a custom level editor, because in a game like this with a lot of units, performance is really important, and the level system should be as closely integrated as possible with the core game. So I created a few 3D models for our tiles and put them all into one directory. I forgot to mention that you can also stack tiles on top of each other. Sort of like how you would in a voxel game except it's not actually 3D in the sense that everything is laid out on a 2D grid logically. You might notice that I also have textures in this directory. It wouldn't be very interesting if every tile had the same texture in our scene either. I basically parsed this directory in my code and loaded all of the models and textures into the game. After loading I created an instance rendering group for each of these models and you can then select which which model to place in the editor. Of course, I did also create a save system so that my changes were permanent. If this eventually becomes a full game, it would be nice to have a tool like this for creating and loading saved levels. So after doing some editing off camera, we have this scene and as you can see, Collision is working quite well. Okay, so there might be a few unrealistic things that happen, but I think this is a good approximation, which also doesn't ruin the performance too much. In a real game, you probably would have lost after the units were in that position for too long anyways. Now it's time to actually add towers to the game. The first type of tower we will be adding to the game is a trebuchet type tower. This type of tower is more practical for the type of tower defense game that I'm going for, because we can only place towers on one side of the map, and trebuchets provide long range firepower. Anyway, I created some animations for the trebuchet and added it to the game as a regular ECS entity. I decided to make the towers regular entities because it would make controlling animations much easier than if I were to hard code the animations in an instancing system. Additionally, the amount of towers in the game aren't even going to go past triple digits so I think it's fine performance wise. The towers need to actually fire something so I added a projectile system which actually does use instancing and now we have a basic demonstration of towers. But right now all of the projectiles have the same velocity and angle so we need to adjust those parameters to actually hit the units. So what I did was do a loop checking all the grids in front of our catapults for units because they can only shoot straight and calculate the trajectories accordingly. It took a bit of tweaking but eventually our first tower was complete. Right now the projectiles just disappear into the ground. They don't harm any units and don't really serve a purpose so let's make the projectiles actually do something meaningful. When the projectiles hit the floor I query for the grids that it intersects and deduct health from any units which are within the radius of the projectiles impact point. Okay, so now the trebuchets are actually functional gameplay wise, but it's kind of unsatisfying that the units just disappear with no trace once they die. Additionally, I find it kind of annoying that the projectiles just despawn once they hit the ground. So I made this death animation in Blender which will spawn once an enemy dies, and I also made the projectile of the trebuchet stop on the ground a bit before despawning to seem more realistic. And to top it all off, I made the projectiles shoot with some inaccuracy to both make them more realistic and to also prevent them from ignoring some units which just walk past the target area while the projectiles are traveling in the air. Okay, our trebuchet is finally finished and we have a baseline for any type of tower with physics based projectiles that don't guarantee a unit hit. So you might be noticing that there are a lot of stray units walking in front of the group. Our trebuchets didn't hit these units and will waste a lot of ammunition trying to hit them with inaccurate strikes. So now it's time to create a close range tower with homing projectiles that actually have a guaranteed hit. However, at the moment, the trebuchets can also technically hit units at close range, so I limited them to hitting units that are a certain distance away. That way, people can't just spam long range AoE towers like the trebuchet to win the game. To begin, I hopped into Blender and created a bow tower which sort of looks like the X bow from Clash Royale. The homing projectiles store a reference to a unit position and just consistently home in on that specific position. By using the lerp function, we are able to guarantee that our projectile reaches a certain point within a time frame. Or that's what I thought I was gonna do, but after diving into the implementation, 
I realized that storing references was simply not possible with the grid hashing system which I had created. So I settled with destroying the closest unit to where the arrow landed while also making sure that the arrows don't take too long to get to their final destination which is no longer a reference but just a fixed position. This is an example of a compromise that you have to make to increase performance in games with a lot of units. And with that I've managed to create a pretty convincing prototype of the game. If you guys want me to expand on this game in a part 2 let me know in the comments. That's all for this video. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like and subscribe, and I hope you guys have a good day.